Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Not Just Yesterday, the Roddy McDowell podcast, and welcome once again to the annual birthday celebration episode for Roddy. Today would have been Roddy's 95th birthday, and in honor of his special day this year, I will be sharing two radio programs which Roddy appeared in that have never been featured on my podcast before. They are the Lux Radio Theater production of How Green Was My Valley and Family Theater's production of The Prince and the Pauper. Most of you are aware that my life has been pretty topsy-turvy this year, and while these radio shows are cutting me a great deal of much-needed slack, I am still very excited to be presenting them to you for this year's celebration. Though I am a chronic burning-the-candle-at-both-ends type of person, I found, as you are all aware as per my last update episode, that I just can't keep doing that anymore. (laughs) So I am not planning on doing another episode this year as there is just way too much piling on me at the moment. And as I'm about to pick up where I left off studying for the Vincent Price biography I'm producing for my YouTube channel, I definitely need all the mental space I can get. So instead of doing a second episode for the holiday season like I usually tend to do, I shall be attending to life, my other creative endeavors, and visiting some much-missed friends for the holiday season this year instead. Having said that, if you wish to enjoy more of my content besides the podcast during the holiday season, please head over to my YouTube channel at www.youtube.com slash Nasha Dean, where you can check out my old Hollywood biography series and catch my in-between content as well. In the meantime, we shall get on with the show. I hope you enjoy these radio programs, and may you all have a very roddy full day. And now here is episode 26 of Not Just Yesterday. Every night at seven, you walk in. As fresh as clover and I begin to sigh all over again Every night at seven You come by like me returning And me oh my, I start in yearning again You seem to bring far away spring near me I'm always in full bloom When you're in the room for every night at seven Every time the same thing happens I fall once again in love But only with you Lux presents Hollywood Lux Radio Theater brings you Walter Pidgeon, Donald Crisp, Maureen O'Hara, Roddy McDowell, and Sarah Allgood in How Green Was My Valley. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. When our curtain rises tonight, it will disclose a scene far removed from the battle-scarred world we live in now. A scene out of yesterday's world. And like the little girl who stepped through the looking glass, you're invited to cross the footlights and spend an hour with the sturdy people of How Green Was My Valley. From the original cast of this Academy Award picture, we have Walter Pidgeon, now starring in Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's White Cargo, and Donald Crisp, Maureen O'Hara, Roddy McDowell, Sarah Allgood, and a chorus of Welsh singers. Besides the award won by this 20th Century Fox production, How Green Was My Valley brought another Academy Award to Donald Crisp for the finest performance of the year by a supporting actor. And then the Academy made it a triple play by presenting John Ford with the award for directing. And before any of this happened, Richard Llewellyn's novel had been a bestseller. So tonight's play comes well recommended. It's a story of a little Welsh coal mining community a place where life, love, and drama go hand in hand, because every descent into the depths of the earth must always be a perilous adventure for the men who dig out its wealth. From soldier and stenographer, from farmer and factory worker, have come letter after letter suggesting how green was my valley for this theater. So many, in fact, they stopped being suggestions and became a command. So this is a command performance for all the friends of Lux Toilet Soap. Lux Soap has always been a favorite with beauty. But nowadays, you'll find beauty at work on the farm and in the factory. 
And unless the papers deceive me, in the Army, too. Hard for an old line sergeant to understand, probably. But in this war, woman power is just as important as man power. And wherever woman power goes to work, Lux Toilet Soap is right there, helping to uh, keep up the morale. Here's the opening curtain now, on the first act of How Green Was My Valley, starring Walter Pigeon as Griffith, Donald Crisp as Mr. Morgan, Maureen O'Hara as Anne Harrod, Roddy McDowell as Hugh, and Sarah Allgood as Beth Morgan. I'm packing my belongings in the shawl my mother used to wear when she went to market, and I'm going from my valley, and this time I shall never return. So begins the story of Hugh Morgan, a man who looks back through 60 years of memories and finds them clear and bright as yesterday. His birthplace and his home is a small Welsh coal valley, once a place of beauty, now ugly and dirty. Towering heaps of slag and belching smokestacks have made his valley so. But old Hugh Morgan is oblivious to all that. I close my eyes on my valley as it is today, and I see it as it was when I was a boy. Green it was, and possessed of the plenty of the earth. In all Wales there was none so beautiful. For in those days the black slag of the coal pits had not yet marred the countryside, nor blackened the beauty of our village. Coal miners were my father and all my brothers, and proud of their trade. Saturday was payday at the mine, and my father and all my brothers would stand in line to receive their wages for a week of honest work. Willem Morgan, three pounds seven. Thank you, sir. Evil Morgan, three pounds seven. Thank you, sir. Jorgen Morgan, three pounds seven. Thank you. Darby Morgan, two pounds five. Yes, sir. Owen Morgan, two pound five. Thank you, sir. Young Willem Morgan, one pound ten. Thank you, sir. Nine Nevis, three pound six. See, Father, Jonas one pound ten this pound week. Six. Good boy. Now home. All of you to your mother. Someone then would strike up a song, and the valley would ring with the sound of many voices. For singing is in my people as sight is in the eye. At home, my mother would be sitting at the door. My father and all my brothers would drop their hard-earned sovereigns into her apron. There you are, girl. A fine hard worker it is. <laughs> Evo next. Your yeah, mother. Evo. Yanto. Debbie. Mother. Owen. Young Willem. It was happy we were at that time, and happier still on the day my brother Evo was married. I will never forget the party after the wedding. And the wedding cake, it took two men to lift. And my father Oh, singing. here's a man, won't get drunk, can't get drunk, can't get drunk. Here's it was then that Mr. Griffith came drunk, to the door. Mr. Griffith, the new minister from the university at Cardiff. I ran to tell my father. Dada, Dada, the minister is here. Mr. The Griffith. Line, chalk the Dada, line, the minister. Hey, what boy? The minister. Oh, 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 the new minister. Put away the beer. Put away the beer. Good evening, Mr. Morgan. Uh, good evening, sir. Some, uh, a cup of tea, is it, Mr. Griffith? Girl, Beth, brew a cup of tea. Oh, no, don't bother, please. Uh, what are you having, Mr. Morgan? Uh, we, oh, we, sir, uh, beer, sir. Beer it is, then, if you please. Beer? Uh-huh. Beer. A pint of beer. Hurry! <laughs> We found then that Mr. Griffith could sing as well as preach. But my sister Angharad could not sing at all for watching him. My sister Angharad brought him something to eat. And there was a great shyness in her as she spoke to him. Mr. Griffith. Good evening. I have brought you something. Thank you. Uh, I am Ivor's sister. Ivor's sister? Then uh, you must be Angharad. <laughs> yes. Well. <Angharad. laughs> All around, the valley echoed with our joy. Happy then, all of us. But soon, very soon, there would be trouble at the colliery. Notice, beginning August 3rd, the scale of wages in this mine will be reduced. One shilling tuppence. That night, my father stayed late at the mine to talk to the owners. When he came home, my brothers were waiting for him at the table. Sit down, Yanto. Sit down, all of you. Supper. We were waiting for your father. We want to know what happened. 
The cut is only a few shillings. There will still be plenty for all of us. Why should there be any wage cut, Father? Why, Darby? It is because they are not getting the old price for coal. Come eat your supper. May we speak first? Well, Yanto? The owners have not given you the real reason for this cut. Huh? Ever since the ironworks at Dallas have closed down, the men from there have come to the colliery willing to work for any wage. So ours come down. And this is only the beginning. Nonsense, Yanto. A good worker is worth good wages, and he will get them. Why should the owners pay more if the men are willing to work for less? Because they are not savages. They are men, too, like us. Men, yes, but not like us. Would they deal with you tonight? No. That is because they have power and we have none. How will we get power, then? From the air? No, from a union of all the men. Union, is it? I had no thought I would ever hear my own sons talking socialist nonsense. What is sense? Unless we stand together. Silence! I'll hear no more about it. This matter is too important for silence. It is not more important than good manners. They will punish you for acting as our spokesman, Father. We must do something about it. Let us all stand together and see how they will act then. Right. The men will come out if we say the word. Willem, I will not be a plank for your politics. I will not be the excuse for any strike. But, Father... Enough now. It is not enough. Owen. I am sorry, sir, but... Hold I... your tongue until I have given you permission to speak. I will speak against injustice anywhere. With permission or without it. Not in this house. In this house and outside. Leave the room. I will also leave the house. I too will leave. I'm with you. We can find lodgings in the village. All of you then? For the last time, come sit down. Finish your supper. I will say no more. We are not questioning your authority, sir. But if manners prevent our speaking the truth, we will be without manners. Get your clothes and go... my son. I know you are still there. Twenty-two weeks the men were out as the strike moved into winter. Any man who was not their friend became their enemy. They knew that my father had opposed the strike, and now it was they opposed him. One night there was a meeting in the hills. My mother made me take her. She stood before the men in the snow and faced them with fury in her eyes. Wait! Wait! Wait till you have heard me! I am Beth Morgan, as you all know. I... I have come up here to tell you what I think of you all. Because you are talking against my husband. You... You are a lot of cowards to go against him. He has done nothing against you, and he never would. And you know it well. To say he is with the owners is not only nonsense, but downright wickedness. There is there's one thing more I've got to say, and it is this. If harm comes to my Gwillem, I will find out the men, and I will kill them with my hands. And this I swear by God Almighty. <laughs> my mother holding firmly to my arm, we turned and passed through the ranks of strangely silent men and into the bitter wind. For hours, it seemed, we stumbled through the snow toward home. Then on the low wooden bridge over the river, blinded by the storm, we slipped and fell into the icy water. On a rocky ledge, I found support and held my mother clear. How long it was we were there, I cannot tell. But when they found us, it was to carry us home, near to death. For weeks I lay in my bed. And then one day I heard Mr. Griffith speaking to the doctor outside my door. Well, doctor, how long for the little one? Oh, it's hard to tell, Mr. Griffith. His legs were frozen to the bone. A year, two years, quiet like that. But I can't promise that he will ever walk again. Nature must take her course, Mr. Doctor, Griffith. Doctor, mind your tongue. I think he heard you. Well, I uh, just explain. Let me go to him. Good morning, Hugh. Good morning, sir. Now, now, where is the light I thought to see in your eye? Are you afraid, boy? I... I... You heard what the doctor said, huh? Yes, sir. And you believed it? You want to walk again, don't you? Yes, sir. Then you must have faith. And if you have, you will walk. 
no matter what all the doctors say. But he said nature must take her course. Nature is the handmaiden of the Lord. I remember one or two occasions when she was given orders to change her course. You know your scripture, boy? Yes, sir. Then you know what's been done before can be done again for you. Do you believe me, Hugh? Yes, sir. Good. You shall see the first daffodil out on the mountain in the spring. Will you? Indeed I will, sir. <laughs> then you will. Now, here is the book I have brought you. Treasure Island. Uh-huh. I could almost wish that I were lying there in your place if it meant reading this book again for the first time. Read it, boy. And I will come back and see you soon again. Thank you, sir. Mr. Griffith? Yes, Aunt Harris. I couldn't let you go without thanking you for giving comfort to my brother. It was only my duty, girl. Oh, no, it was more than duty. Yes, Hugh is a fine boy. And you are a fine family. Will you... Will you be coming to supper soon, Mr. Griffith? Mm, later, perhaps, when you are finished with doctors and such. Huh? I will hurry them away then. Good. For many months, I lay there and my mother upstairs. And we could talk to each other with tappings on the wall. It was a great day when she came down into her house. On my father's arm, she came to my bed and stood watching me with diamonds in her eyes, with her hand to her mouth. You, you, my son, my son. Mama, your hair, it's, it's all white. <laughs> it's, it's the old snow got into it, boy. <laughs> then she touched my cheek and kissed me fiercely. My father tiptoed to the door and beckoned for my brothers to come in, for they had returned to the house to live. We have come back, mother. Oh. In an instant, my mother was in their arms, not knowing whether to laugh or cry. Yanto. Daddy. <laughs> Owen. <laughs> come, girl, come. Then outside, we heard the voices. The men of the mine coming to sing for my mother. Willem. Will you come to the door, girl? But what is it? It is for you, girl. Come along now. Easy, young. Willem. For me? Well, come, say something, girl. Say something. What, what can I say? You found plenty to say the last time you spoke. <laughs> <laughs> it should be easier now with friends. Well, well, come... Come and eat, everyone. <laughs> it was a gay time. We laughed and sang fit to burst our lungs. Even old Mr. Parry, the doerest of the elders in our church. Good evening, Yanto Morgan. Good evening, Mr. Parry. Yanto, I haven't seen you in chapel lately. I've been too busy. What business, may I ask? Mine? Huh? Only asking a civil question, I was. And having a civil answer, Mr. Parry, I have been busy with the union. The union, ah. Unions are the work of the devil. You will come to no good end, Yanta Morgan. At least I am doing something, not talking a lot of rubbish in chapel. Yanto? Yanto, why do you think we of the chapel talk rubbish? My remark was not aimed at you, Mr. Griffith. Then aim it. Aim it, my boy. Very well. Because you make yourselves out to be shepherds of the flock, and yet you allow your sheep to live in filth and poverty, and if they try to raise their voices against it, you calm them by saying their suffering is the will of God. Yanto, enough now. Mr. Morgan, Yanto, I have not expressed my views here because I have no wish to interfere with a family disagreement. You have my permission to speak, Mr. Griffith. Well, then, here is what I think. Have your union. Alone you are weak. Together you are strong, but remember that with strength goes responsibilities to others and to yourselves, for you cannot conquer injustice with more injustice, only with justice and with the help of God. Mr. Griffith, are you coming outside your position in life? Your business is spiritual. My business, Mr. Parry, is anything that comes between man and the spirit of God. And the deacons shall hear that you've been preaching socialism. Mr. Parry, loose the old devil's teeth for it. Yanto, Gwillem. He is our guest. Now, enough. 
Beth, girl, give Mr. Parry a pint of home brewed and put his pipe back into his mouth. I will give him a good clout for the frying pan. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Come. A bit of singing, is it? A song. All. Come. Come down the sea, my song. When the when, when the when. I'm hurried. In the kitchen again? Oh, it is hungry they are. Here, let me help you with the fire. Mr. Griffith, will we always be in your debt now you have made us a family again? Ah, there's enough coal, I think. Oh, look at your hands. They will need cleaning. Here, let me see. Oh. Why, what is it? Why, your hands. They are like my father's and my brother's. Have you been down the mines? Ten years while I was studying. Ten years? Mm-hmm. Oh, here, now a bit of soap. Oh, no, no, please don't bother. I'll get it. Now, look, you. You are king in the chapel, but I will be queen in my own kitchen. Now, the hands, please. You will be queen wherever you walk. What does that mean? I... I should not have said it. Why not? I have no right to speak to you so. If the right is mine to give, you have it. In just a few moments, Mr. DeMille and our stars, Walter Pidgeon, Donald Crisp, Maureen O'Hara, Roddy McDowell, and Sarah Allgood, will bring us Act Two of How Green Was My Valley. And now, here's a young business girl greeting her roommate, a bit enviously. Hi, Mary. Oh, lucky you to get home early. Phew, what a day we had. Supper's nearly ready, Jane. Oh, wonderful. I'm certainly for a cozy evening right here at home. Um, darling, uh, now don't get mad, but... I promised we'd both be at the USO dance at nine. They needed more girls. Mary Lou Davis, if you think... Oh, now, Janie, be an angel. There's plenty of warm water in the bathroom, and... And look, here's a nice new cake of Lux soap. Oh, you'll feel lots different after your beauty bath. You know you will. And later... Oh, to think I might have missed this party. Gosh, it's wonderful dancing with you, Jane. You're mighty sweet, you know. Score one for Jane's smart little roommate. She knew what a wonderful beauty pickup a Lux toilet soap bath can be. Try it next time you're tired and have a date to keep. Cover yourself all over with the rich, creamy Lux soap lather. Active lather that carries away perspiration, every trace of dust and dirt in a twinkling. Relax a few moments in this fragrant, delightful bath. When you step out, how soft and smooth your skin feels. And most important of all, it's exquisitely fresh. You're sure of daintiness. Sure of skin that's sweet. Hollywood screen stars use their gentle complexion soap as a daily bath soap, too. They love the delicate perfume Lux soap has. A flower-like fragrance that clings lightly to the skin. You'll find this satin-smooth white soap makes a truly luxurious bath. Get three cakes of Lux Toilet Soap tomorrow. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of How Green Was My Valley. Starring Walter Pigeon as Griffith, Donald Crisp as Mr. Morgan, Maureen O'Hara as Ann Harrod, Roddy McDowell as Hugh, and Sarah Allgood as Beth Morgan. I lay in the wall bed, recovering from my hurt. The strike was settled, and the men returned to the mine. Always through that time, I kept my faith that I would walk again. Then one bright, windy day in early spring, Mr. Griffith came for me as he had promised. He carried me to the top of the hill above our village. Now then, boy, down you go. There. Now, put your feet apart and stand on them. Now, you can walk you if you try. Come, lad. Walk to me. Can I, sir? Walk over here. One step. One step. Oh. And now another. Come on. See? I'm walking. 
His walking I am, sir. <laughs> There's a good lad. There's a good old man you are. Now, rest a bit, eh? Mr. Griffith, I have walked. Of course you have. And you have been lucky, Hugh. Lucky to suffer and lucky to spend these weary months in your bed. For so God has given you the chance to make spirit within yourself. And as your father cleans his lamp to have good light, so keep clean your spirit. How, sir? By prayer, boy. And I don't mean shouting and mumbling and wallowing in religious sentiment. Prayer is only another name for good, clean, direct thinking. When you pray, think. Think well what you are saying. And make your thoughts into things that are solid. In that manner, your prayer will have strength. And that strength shall become a part of you, mind, body, and spirit. Yes, sir. Now then, up on my shoulders, boy. And remember, the first duty of these new legs is to get you to chapel on Sunday. Oh, they will, sir. They will. My new legs carried me to chapel and home again, too. And it was on that Sunday that Mr. Evans came to call on my father. Mr. Evans, the owner of the mine. Yes, yes, yes. Come in, come in. What under the blaze? Who is it? Good morning, Morgan. Oh, Mr. Evans. Good morning, Mr. Evans. Sit down, sir. Uh, thank you, Morgan. Oh, oh, oh. oh your pardon. A, a pail of water, sir. <laughs> I, uh, I've been soaking my poor feet, sir. Beth, my boots, my boots. Sit down, sir. Now, now Morgan, to business. Yes, sir. Um, I come here on a very delicate mission, Morgan. No trouble at the mine, no, sir. No, 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 no trouble, but it worries me. Yes, sir. I'm here to get your permission, and that my son Yestin may have permission... <laughs> <clears throat> Bless you, Morgan. Thank you, sir. Now, now, now where was I? Um, uh, permission. Oh, yes, yes, uh, permission. Uh, that my son, Yestin, may have permission, with your daughter, Ang Harrod's permission, uh, to call upon her. Uh, uh, there we are. Your son and my... Oh, oh, oh. Hmm. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> Morgan? Mm, uh... We are a very proud family, Mr. Evans. Ah, ha, ha. But you have my permission, Mr. Evans, to give your son permission to speak to Ang Harrod with her permission. Oh, thank you, thank you, Morgan. I'm very much obliged to you. Uh, he's just outside. I'll tell him I'm much obliged. Uh, good day, sir. Uh, good yes, day. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good day. Beth, my boots. My boots, girl. <laughs> And so it was that wealthy Yestin Evans came to ask for Ang Harrod in marriage. And Mr. Griffith knew of it and stayed away from our house. For a whole week we never saw his face. Until at last Ang Harrod could wait no longer. Who is it? One moment. Ang Harrod, you shouldn't be here. I couldn't spend another night without knowing what has happened. What is wrong? Wrong? Oh, you know what I mean. Why have you changed towards me? Why am I a stranger now? What have I done? No, you've done nothing. The blame is mine. Your mother spoke to me after chapel. She is happy to think you will be having plenty all your days. Well, yes, and Evans. You could do no better. Oh, I don't want him. I Ang... want you. Ang Harrod, I too have spent nights trying to think this thing out. When I took up this work, I knew what it meant. It meant devotion and sacrifice. That I was perfectly willing to do. But to share it with another, do you think I'll have you going threadbare all your life, depending on the charity of others for your good meals, our, our children growing up in cast-off clothing, and ourselves thanking God for parenthood in a house full of bits? It could make no difference. No. I can bear with such a life for the sake of my work. But I think I would start to kill if I saw the white come to your hair. 20 years before it's time. Why? Why would you start to kill? Look at me. Are you a man or a saint? I am no saint, but I have a duty towards you. Let me do it. Go back to your house, Angharad. It is late.
My sister and Yeston Evans were married at the chapel by Mr. Griffith. My sister left our village then to live in Cape Town. My brothers Gwillem and Owen left too for America, and our house was lonely without them. Mr. Griffith used to come of an evening to tutor me for school. Many problems he gave us, me and my father, sitting in the kitchen by the stove. Now then, the bathtub holds 100 gallons. A fills it at the rate of 20 gallons a minute, and B at the rate of 10 gallons a minute. Got that, Mr. Morgan? 20 and 10 gallons. Yes, sir. Now then, C is a hole that empties it at the rate of five gallons a minute. How long to fill the tub? Oh. Dear silly, trying to fill a bathtub full of holes indeed. A sum it is, girl, a sum. A problem for the mind. For Hugh's examination into school next month. That old national school. It's silly they are with their sums. Who would pour water in a bathtub full of holes? Who would think of it only a madman? It is to see if the boy can calculate, girl. Figures, nothing else. How many gallons and how long? In a bathtub full of holes. Now I know why I have such a tribe of sons. It is you, Beth Morgan, is the cause. Look, you, Mr. Griffith, have you something else? Ah, uh, the decimal point. The decimal? Yeah. The decimal point, then. And peace to my house. Oh, go and scratch. Uh... I went to the national school. On the first day, I returned in tatters with my face bruised and bleeding. It had been a fight in the yard with the school bully. What happened, Hugh? What is it, lad? Speak up. I... I fell on the mountain. Fell indeed. Look at him. Ah, uh, Hugh, did you win, boy? No. Yanto, fetch Dai Bando, the fighter. Bring him here. Dai Bando it is. Willem! Quiet, girl. Hugh, are you willing to go to school tomorrow? Yes, sir. Good. From tonight, you shall get a penny for every mark on your face. Sixpence for a bloody nose. A shilling for a black eye. And two shillings for a broken nose. William, stop it. Fight again, Hugh. And when you come home, not another look will you get from me. Not another word. Break your old nose, then. Break your mother's heart every time you go out of the house. Our boy must fight, Beth. Fight? Fight, is it? Another beating like that, and he'll walk home dead. Beating? Beating, is it? He's had no beating. A hiding, yes, but no beating. Give the boy time, and it will be he that's giving the beating, is it? Mr. Morgan. Ah, Daibando, come into the house. Good evening. Good evening, Mrs. Morgan. Leave off your hat. Uh, yes, Mrs. Morgan. Is Kafatha coming? He's here. Kafatha? A match, is it? <laughs> He'll make no match without his trainer, Mr. Morgan. Oh, it's not a match. I want you to teach my son how to box. No, no, to fight first. Too many call themselves boxers who are not even fighters. Boxing is an art, is it? It is, it is. An art. Bloody head's an art. Oh, go along with you, girl. A cup of tea for the men, is it? Tea? Uh, no tea, Mrs. Morgan. No, in training we are. A glass of beer, if you please. But tubs full of holes. And now prize fighters. Now, boy, to work. Your hands like this. Yes. So. Yes, sir. Your feet apart. Yes, sir. Now mind your guard. And when your man rushes, you do so and so. Guard up, guard up now. Let's... Hit him, you. Go on, go on. You've got him now. Hit him, you. Stop it. Stop it, I say. Mr. Jonas, mind you. So, our little coal mining friend has been indulging in his favorite sport again, eh? I, I was fighting, Mr. Jonas, but it is not my favorite sport, sir. Come here. You see this sick? You know what it is for? Yes, sir. Good. <coughs> fight, will you? Fight, eh? I'll teach you to fight. <coughs> you dirty little sweet. <coughs> I'll teach you to fight. <coughs> well, I will go to my death. He's cut to the bone. Did you get that in school, Hugh? I, I was fighting. Who was it? Mr. Jonas, is it? We'll have a word with Mr. Jonas. No. And why not? Broke the rule when I fought. There is no rule for that. But he warned me. Rubbish, boy. Wait, Abby. This is Hugh's affair. He shall decide. Say the word, lad, and we'll have the bones hot from his flesh. No. Leave him alone. Oh, carry. Carry him into the house. Carry him in. <gasps> Easy, lad. 
Easy. Kvartha. Well, Dibando. The lad is hurt bad. He is. I think there is work for us, is it? There is. <laughs> Class will come to order. Yesterday, all of you brilliant children made some progress, a very small progress, in the matter of linear measurements. We will now begin... Good morning. Yes? What is it? Uh, good morning, Mr. Uh, uh... Jonas is my name. Ah, Jonas. We have come to the right place indeed, Kavartha. Mr. Jonas, I am Daibando. What can I do for you? A man is never too old to learn, is it, Mr. Jonas? No. I was in school myself once, but no great one for knowledge. <laughs> Look here, what do you want? Knowledge? Mr. Jonas, how would you go about taking the measurement of a stick? Well, by its length, of course. And how would you measure a man who would use a stick on a boy one-third his size? Yes, how? I don't understand. Now, you are good in the use of a stick, Mr. Jonas. But boxing is my subject, according to the rules laid down by the good Marquess of Queensbury. Heaven rest his soul. And happy I am to pass on my knowledge to you. <laughs> what, what, what do you want, please? Get him into position now, Kavartha. Yes. Put up your fist, Mr. Jonas. Stop it! Stop it! Now look. To make a good boxer, you must have a good right hand like this, Mr. Jonas. Oh! oh. You see? Stand him up, Kavartha. Up it is. Up, Mr. Jonas. And this, Mr. Jonas, is how you will punish a man with your left and put oh. your soul into it. Oh, no, no, stop. <laughs> here, 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 Mr. Jonas. No sleeping now. Why, the gentleman's talking to you. Raise him up. On your feet, Mr. Jonas. Why, the lesson's only beginning. Oh. Boys and girls, could I have your attention, please? I am not accustomed to speaking in public. Only public houses. <laughs> but this blow never used. It's against the rules. Break a man's nose. But this one is fair. <laughs> help him. Help him. He's asleep again. Ah, uh, sleep, is it? I'm afraid he will never make a boxer. No aptitude for knowledge. Good morning, Mr. Jonas. I stayed on at the National School, and Mr. Jonas left. And then one evening as I returned home, I heard the whistle at the mine. The whistle that meant only one thing to us. Tragedy. An accident. Someone in that black pit had died. Griffith, Mr. Griffith! You, come here. Someone hot, who is it? Quiet, lad. We'll know in a moment. They are bringing up the cage. Stand back! Just the cage! Quiet, girl, quiet. Mr. Griffith. Well, Leonto, who is it? It's Eva. He fell under a tram on the lower level. He's been killed. And so Ivor was gone. Ivor, the eldest, the solid and dependable one. And our grief was nameless. There came a time later when I returned from school with my certificate of graduation. My father's eyes were pride-filled when I placed it in his hand. Ah, is a good paper. With honors, then. Our son is a scholar, girl. What is it, you? I can't make sense with it. Latin it is. It is written in Latin, Mama. Latin, is it? Why not good Welsh? Or even English? Ah, uh, it is the fashion, girl. Fashion. Decimal point. And bathtubs full of holes. Oh, my poor Hugh. They've stuffed your head with Latin, then. Beth, my old beauty, you. A black eye, is it? <laughs> Latin. Now then, Hugh, what will it be? To Cardiff to school, then the university to be a lawyer, is it? Or a doctor? Dr. Hugh Morgan. That would be something special. With a lovely horse and trap, and a good black suit and a shirt with starch. Oh, there is good, my little one. Well, Hugh... What will it be? Huh? I, I will go down the colliery with you, sir. The colliery? Have sense, boy. The colliery is no place for you. Why not try for a respectable job? 
Respectable? Are you and his brothers a lot of old jailbirds, then? Oh, leave it now, Beth. I only want the best for the boy. If he is as good a man as you and his brothers, I will rest happy. I'm thinking of the boy's future. Hugh is a scholar. Why take brains down a coal mine? I would rather, sir. All right. Decide for yourself. But blame yourself if you are wrong now. The colliery, sir. All right, the colliery it is. Good night. Where are you going? To get drunk. <gasps> It was to work, then. Work to earn bread for those one loves. But I felt a man in truth to be coming up the colliery cage with my father, sharing his tiredness, blacked by the same dust. And I was happy. Then in time, my sister Angharad came back, but alone, without her husband. She did not come to our house, but stayed at the big Ivan's house, her house, on the top of the hill. To see Mrs. Evans, please. And who are you? I am Hugh Morgan. Oh, her brother. Her brother, is it in it? Yes, Mrs. Nicholas. Hugh Morgan. This way, please. Is that someone for me, Mrs. Nicholas? It's your brother, Mrs. Evans. Hugh. Oh, Hugh. You didn't come to see us, Aunt Harrod. Hugh. Uh, Mrs. Nicholas, will you bring some tea, please? Tea? Yes, Mrs. Evans. Sit down, Hugh. Oh, there is grown you are and changed. You, too. Oh, I look ill and ought to take care of myself. Everyone coming in the house says so. So you say it, too, and let us finish with it. But tell me all the news. How is... How are all the boys and girls we used to know? Well, the Jenkins girls are married. Mordwin Hughes is going to be a doctor. Reese Howells is in a solicitor's office. And Mr. Griffith is still first up and last to bed. You... How is he? Not as he was. Is he ill? Inside, in his eyes and in his voice, like you. Please go home, you. Go home at once. I'm sorry. Now then, Mrs. Evans, tea is it? Here you are. Leave it, Mrs. Nicholas. I will pour. Well, I always did the pouring for Mr. Yeston's poor mother. I will pour, I said. Yes, Mrs. Evans. A new mistress is like new sheets. A little bit stiff, but washing's to come. Why do you have her here? Oh, 37 years with a family, or so she tells me 60 times a day. Have some tea, Hugh. You. you don't want me to go? No, Hugh. I'm sorry for being nasty. Please stay. Oh, Hugh, I, I tried to tell Mother. I tried to write. Oh, oh Hugh, it, <laughs> it's lonely I am. <laughs> <laughs> Below in the kitchen, the tongues began to wag. Mrs. Nicholas and the women of the neighborhood. Not for me to say, only the housekeeper I am. Thirty-seven years in the family and living to curse the day. Why, what is it, Mrs. Nicholas? Divorce. Divorce? Oh, yes. No. Saying nothing, I am, but that is what is in her mind. She is here without her husband, is it? And why? It is because she's in love with this preacher. Oh, preacher? Mr. Preacher, I said, Mr. Griffith, it is. But Mr. Griffith has not been near the house. What difference is that, girl? Not a word now. We will not say a word, Mrs. Nicholas. No, oh, no, indeed, not a word. No. Divorce, Mr. Griffith, it is. The preacher and Mrs. Evans. Don't say I told you. Divorce. Divorce. The knives that can be hidden in idle tongues. For generations, the Morgans had lived in this valley. Mr. Griffith and Mrs. Evans. And now our name was touched with slander. Divorce. Our house looked strange to me. And then I knew why. For the first time I could remember, our front door was shut tight in the daytime. <laughs> Pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille presents Walter Pidgeon, Donald Crisp, Maureen O'Hara, Roddy McDowell, and Sarah Allgood, who will bring us Act Three of How Green Was My Valley. Well, here's Sally, looking very excited. It's a special news we've got tonight. Let's hurry up and tell people. It's our good news for flower lovers. Yes, our news about flowers everyone can grow, whether they have gardens or live in city apartments. No one will want to miss our rainbow garden offer of choice tulip bulbs. These gorgeous tulips can be grown outdoors for May flowering or made to bloom indoors in time for Easter. And remember, now is the time to plant tulip bulbs. Sally, won't you tell our audience how to get them? It's so easy. To get ten of these full-size, first-quality tulip bulbs, send the wrapper from one cake of Lux toilet soap or the opening tab from a box of Lux flakes with 25 cents in coin to Lux Rainbow Garden, Box 1, New York City. Be sure to include your name and address. Thanks, Sally. I hope our listeners are writing that down. Lux Rainbow Garden, Box 1, New York City. I want to urge flower lovers everywhere not to miss this wonderful Lux and Lux toilet soap offer. These bulbs are not ordinary. Only the finest varieties are included in this offer. There are stately Darwins, clear bright cottage blooms, and breeder tulips of rare, rich coloring. They come in wonderful shades of scarlet and cerise, clear yellows, and rich glowing pinks and orange. Just think, so soon after winter to have these glorious rainbow colors in your garden. By planting them in pots, you can even make them bloom indoors in time for Easter. An illustrated leaflet with exact planting directions for indoors or outdoors comes with each set of bulbs. These same bulbs will flower again year after year. To get this choice collection of ten fine bulbs, just send 25 cents in coin, no stamps, please, with a wrapper from a cake of Lux toilet soap or opening tab from a box of Lux, together with your name and address, to Lux Rainbow Garden, Box 1, New York City. Please allow at least two weeks for your tulip bulbs to reach you. Send for as many sets as you like, enclosing 25 cents and Lux soap wrapper or Lux tab for each additional set. If you prefer, you can get handy order blanks from your dealer. Don't delay, because fall is the time for planting. This offer is good only in the United States. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. The curtain rises on the third act of How Green Was My Valley, starring Walter Pigeon, Donald Crisp, Maureen O'Hara, Roddy McDowell, and Sarah Allgood. As the slag had spread over my valley, so now a blackness spread over the minds of its people. My sister and the preacher. Each day I heard their names together, and as many times did I fight in the streets. Dada? Fighting again, Hugh. More trouble with the Philistines, is it? Yes, Dada. Hugh, what is it now? Look at your face. Even John, he... He said things about Angharad and Mr. Griffith. Children, too. You were right, my son. You were right to fight. My coat, girl, I'm going to the mine. You will be back? I will be back for breakfast. You will not go to chapel, then? No. And if they do this thing, I will never set foot in the chapel again as long as I live. I will have the sheets warm on your bed. There's an old beauty you are. <laughs> go and scratch, boy. Mother... What is this about the chapel? Tonight, after the service, a deacon's meeting over Angharad. Angharad? But she has done nothing. Nothing is enough for people who have minds like theirs. Oh, Hugh, my little one, I hope when you're grown, their tongues will be slower to hurt. But will Angharad be at the meeting? No, none of us will be there. But the disgrace will not stay away. I will go, Mother. <laughs> Mr. Griffith spoke that night in the chapel. Pale and looking very old, he descended from the pulpit and faced the deacons. This is the last time I will talk in this chapel. I am leaving the valley with regret toward those who have helped me here and who have let me help them. But for the rest of you, those of you who have only proved that I have wasted my time among you, I have only this to say. There is not one among you who has had the courage to come to me and accuse me of wrongdoing. 
And yet, by any standard, if there has been a sin, I am the one who should be branded the sinner. Will anyone raise his voice here now to accuse me? No. You're cowards, too, as well as hypocrites. But I don't blame you. The fault is mine as much as yours. The idle tongues, the poverty of mind which you have shown, mean that I have failed to reach most of you with the lesson I was given to teach. I thought when I was a young man that I would conquer the world with truth, with the golden sound of the word. But only a few of you heard, only a few of you understood. The rest of you put on black and sat in chapel. Why do you come here? Why do you dress your hypocrisy in black and parade it before your God on Sunday? From love? No, for you've shown that your hearts are too withered to receive the love of your divine Father. I know why you've come. I've seen it in your faces Sunday after Sunday as I've stood here before you. Fear has brought you here. Horrible, superstitious fear. Fear of divine retribution. A bolt of fire from the skies the vengeance of the Lord and the justice of God. But you have forgotten the love of Jesus. You disregard his sacrifice. Death, fear, flames, horror, and black clothes. Hold your meeting then, but know if you do this in the name of God and in the house of God, you blaspheme against him and his word. My dear Ang Harad, I am leaving the valley. I am leaving tonight and... Mr. Griffith? Well, Hugh, uh, I'm glad you've come. Thank you, sir. Is there anything I can do? Indeed there is. You can do me a great service. This watch... My father gave it to me when I entered the ministry. It's marked time we both loved. Take it. Oh, no, sir. A service I said you'd be doing me. No need for us to shake hands, Hugh. We will live in the minds of each other. Mr. Griffith, won't you see Ang Harrod before you go? She wants you to. No. If I were to see her again, Hugh, I couldn't find the strength to leave her. Goodbye, boy. And there's a good old man you are. Listen. It's the mine. Something's happened at the mine. Come along, lad. Mr. Griffith, Daddy is dead. Daddy is dead. Come along. A cave in, it was. A cave in on the lower level. My man is there. Let me through. My man is there. A cave in and 30 men beneath it. There's another cage coming up. Stand back, you men. Stand back. Those women with relatives, let them to the pit. There they are, the second king. Oh! Henry! Henry! Mr. Griffith, I don't see Dada. Shai, is Gwilla Morgan up? Not yet, sir. Gwilla Morgan, Gwilla Morgan. Has anyone seen Gwilla Morgan? Ang Harrod. Oh, my, my father. He is still there. Oh, still there. Mama, he is still there. Gwilla. Men! Men, listen to me! Who is for Gwilla Morgan and the others? Who will come down with me? I, for one. He is the blood of my heart. Come along, men. Fix him, shovels here, quick. On the cage, you men. We're going down. I am going with you, sir. I'm going to find Dada. If you wish, lad. Ready now? Wait, wait, Mr. Griffith. Yes, son, Harrod. You will come back. You must come back. I said tonight, if I were to see you again, I couldn't find the strength to leave you. Oh, you will come back then. I know. Ready then? Send the cage down. started soon. Morgan! Willem Morgan! Dada! Dada! They were working in this tunnel, you're sure? They were here in the one beyond, but the props have all given away. We cannot go much farther, sir. We will go on. Dada! Willem Morgan! Dada, where are you? You, you wait. 
I heard him. Quiet, everyone. Call again, Hugh. Watch your foot here, it's deeper. You men back there bring tops. There he is. There. Easy, man. Mr. Griffith, he's caught beneath the rock. We'll never get him out alive. Never. Dada. Oh, Dada. You, lad. You, my son. I was going to take you out, Dada. No. The rock. Do not dig. It will fall. We are going to take you out. You, my lad. There's a good old man you are. A good old man. Dada. Oh, Dada. Come, you. <laughs> Here comes the cage. Oh, the cage, Mama. They are bringing him up. Gwillem. Gwillem is dead. Oh, no, Mama. He will be alive. Gwillem is dead. I know he is dead. He came to me just now as I stood here. Ivor was with him. He spoke to me and told me of the glory he had seen. Men like him can never die. They are with us still, real in memory as they were real in flesh, loving and beloved forever. How green was my valley then, and the valley of them that have gone. Applause calls back five stars who gave five brilliant performances tonight. Walter Pigeon, Donald Crisp, Maureen O'Hara, Roddy McDowell, and Sarah Allgood. Thank you, CB. The five of us spent a number of weeks together making the picture. And, uh, well, uh, speaking for myself, this little reunion is a very great pleasure. And for all of us, Walter, you have rather a special feature in this cast tonight, CB. Two players from the world-famous Abbey Theatre of Dublin. Sarah Allgood and Maureen O'Hara. Well, I spent only a few years there, Mr. Crisp, but, but that was long enough even, uh, to appreciate the tradition established by many fine artists like Miss Allgood. Thank you, Maureen, dear. That's very nice of you. Nothing gives a producer more satisfaction than a cast of real troopers. Whether they've had years of experience or take to acting as young as Roddy McDowell. If I can stay in the theater as long as you have, sir, I'll be very happy. What have I got to go about 40 years? <laughs> You'll have at least that if you keep up the kind of work you've been doing, Roddy. And tonight we're delighted to welcome you and Sarah Allgood and Maureen O'Hara to this stage for the first time. I've enjoyed being here, Mr. DeMille, but I don't really feel like a stranger. I've heard the Lux Radio Theater so much, and of course I use Lux soap ever since I came to Hollywood. I hardly think I could get along without it. You see, complexion care is so easy when you have Lux soap. And even now it's easy to get Lux soap anywhere. Uh, C.B., we're all anxious to hear about your next play. Well, next Monday we have a comedy, Walter. One of the screen's recent laugh hits from 20th Century Fox. It's called The Magnificent Dope. And our stars are the same three players who are making a hit in the picture. Don Amici, Henry Fonda, and Lynn Barry. Don plays a kind of human dynamo who thinks he can make a success out of anyone until he tackles Mr. Thaddeus Page, played by Henry Fonda. At any rate, it makes a great show for us next Monday night. I've heard a lot about the picture, C.B., and I want to hear it. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. You won the Academy Award all over again tonight. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, Join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Don Amici, Henry Fonda, and Lynn Barry in The Magnificent Dope. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. (laughs) 
Here's a question for the ladies. Have you been throwing away explosives we need to win the war? Well, if you still throw away waste fats, you're doing that very thing. Keep all used frying fats, meat drippings, and bacon grease, and strain them into a clean wide top can. Your meat dealer will pay you for them. So save waste kitchen fats to make explosives. Donald Crisp will soon be seen in the Warner Brothers picture, The Adventures of Mark Twain. Maureen O'Hara, Roddy McDowell, and Sarah Allgood appeared by courtesy of 20th Century Fox. Miss O'Hara will be seen in The Black Swan. Miss Allgood in Life Begins at 8.30. And Roddy McDowell is currently on the screen in The Pied Piper. Heard in tonight's play were Gail Gordon as narrator, Stuart Robertson as Di Bondo, Joseph Kearns as Kapartha, Paul Langton as Yanto, Kemble Cooper as Mr. Jonas, Gloria Gordon as Mrs. Nicholas, Frederick Warlock as Mr. Evans, and Esther Mason, Herbert Evans, Fred Mackay, Claire Videra, Norman Field, and Stephen Muller. Tune in next Monday night to hear Donna Michi, Henry Fonda, and Lynn Barry in The Magnificent Dope. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been John M. Kennedy. Family Theater presents Carlton Young, Roddy McDowell, and Terry Kilburn. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents Roddy McDowell and Terry Kilburn in Mark Twain's The Prince and the Pauper. To introduce the drama, your host, Carlton Young. Thank you, Gene. The beloved American author, Mark Twain, had this to say once about a story he had written. It may have happened, it may not have happened, but it could have happened. It may be that the wise and the learned believed it in the old days. It may be that only the unlearned and the simple loved it and gave credence to it. Well, it may be that I'm unlearned and simple then, for I loved his story when I first read it, and I still give credence to it today. And I know that I'm not the only one, for millions of readers have acclaimed this warm, human, and tender classic of a boy of royal blood and one of a beggar's family who proved that not only our appearance is oft deceptive, but that the quality of mercy becomes a throned monarch better than his crown. Here then with Roddy McDowell as the Royal Edward of England and Terry Kilburn as Tom Canty the beggar lad, we bring you Mark Twain's famous story, The Prince and the Pauper. In the ancient city of London, on an autumn day of the 16th century, two boys were born. All England spoke of one of these babies, for he was Edward Tudor, Prince of Wales, someday to be crowned king. But there was no talk about the other baby, Tom Canty, except among the family of paupers whom he had just come to trouble with his presence. Now it was several years later that the ragged beggar lad, Tom Canty, found himself approaching Westminster Palace. All his youthful life he had dreamed of princes and royalty. And on this day he had determined that at the very least he would see a prince. And so he made his way to Westminster Palace. And as he made his way through the gaping crowd of country gawks and London idlers gathered there to perchance obtain a glimpse of royalty, Tom's breath came quick and short with excitement, and his eyes widened with wonder and delight. For there, on the other side of the golden barred gates, on a vast lawn of emerald greensward, was the prince. It, it is he. The prince. Oh, I, I'm seeing the prince at last. Here now, you lout. Away from that gate. Oh, but, but I meant no harm, soldier. I, I and just... no talk back from you either. Oh. I'll teach you to mind your manners, you oh. young beggar. Oh. Now, away oh. you. Oh, my God. How darest thou use a poor lad like that? Release him at once, do you hear? Why, the prince. But, your royal highness, the, royal the highness, beggar was gaping at you, he was. I saw very well what he was doing. And thou hast no right to use the king's meanest subject so. Bring the lad here. Open the palace gates and let him in. Into the palace, your highness, but... That is my command, guard. I shall take the lad to my private quarters. Perhaps in that way I may make amends for the affront you have given to one of our loyal people.
Here, lad. We shall both have privacy and comfort here. Pray to sit down. Oh, but... But, Your Royal Highness... Sit I... down, lad. Well, thank you kindly, sir. What is thy name, lad? Uh, Tom Canty, to please thee, sir. And uh, where dost thou live, Tom? In the city, please thee, sir. Awful Court, uh, off of Pudding Lane. Awful Court? <laughs> Truly, it is an odd name. Uh, tell me more of this, uh, this court in which you live. From your appearance, it it cannot be a very merry place. Oh, it it's not too bad there, sir. There be punch and duty shows betimes, and, and antic monkeys, and, and we lads do strive against each other with cudgels sometimes. Sayest thou, lad, tell me more. Well, in the summer we wade and swim in the river, and, and splash and duck each other in the water, diving and tumbling and <laughs> having great sport. Mary, I would like that. It sounds glorious. If I could but clothe me in raiment like thine and strip my feet and revel in the mud once, just once, with none to rebuke or forbid me, why... Oh, and if I could clothe me once, sweet sir, as thou art clad, just once. So be it, lad. Doff thy rags and don these splendors. Oh, your highness, you, you mean... Well, why not, lad? We shall change raiment and have the moment's happiness and change again before anyone come to molest. Quickly now, let us exchange. <laughs> It is, it's like a miracle, Tom. Your hair, your face, your eyes. Why, they are the same as mine. With my clothing on you, none could deny that you might be the Prince of Wales. Oh, please, sir. This strange resemblance frightens me. Take off my rags. Give them back to me before someone enters. If they did, you could command them to leave. Dressed as you are now, they would obey you. Oh, I beg of you, sir. Let us change and again immediately. Now that I am clothed as thou wert, I am able to feel as thou did when that brute soldier at the gate... Tom, is that not a bruise upon your hand? Oh, it, it is but a slight thing. And your highness knows that the poor man at arms was only attempting Peace. to... It was a shameful thing, and cruel. If the king could only... Stir not a step till I return, Tom. Oh, your highness, wait. Don't go until we change clothes again. We can change later. I intend to deal with that ruffian right now. Wait here. Oh, but your highness, wait. Guard, open this gate. Unbar it at once. Aye, that I will. I'll teach you to maltreat the subject of... Hey, that, you beggar spawn. For what you got me from his highness. You dare to strike me? You dare to touch the person of the Prince of Wales? The Prince of Wales, sayest thou? Aye, your prince. And thou shalt hang for laying thy hand upon me. Thou shalt have me hanged, you beggar. <laughs> you hear that, friends? The lunatic lad thinks himself the Prince of Wales. I am the Prince of Wales. Oh, of course, your royal highness. If thou sayest so... Off with you now, you crazy beggar! Take your hands off me! I shall have you hanged! I am the prince! Hold, hold! Hold, ye scoundrels! What are ye, a pack of kennel rats to be thus staring at this poor lad? Oh, it is none of your affair, meddler! Be gone with you, lest we give you a taste of our metal too! Oh, if it is taste you speak of, if it is taste, perhaps then you have some for the edge of my blade. I shall be happy to accommodate any who ask. <laughs> so you're not eager then. Very well, be off with you. The lad remains here with me. I am beholden to you, sir. Uh, what is your name, pray? I, I am Miles Hendon, lad. I am Edward, Prince of Wales. You shall be well rewarded for your actions this day. Why, thank you, your highness. You laugh at me. You do not believe. No. no, I do not laugh at you. There is no laughter in pain and misfortune. Nay, come with me, lad, to my lodgings for rest and a bite to sup. And tell me there of these adventures that have befallen thee. Very well, Miles Hendon. The prince shall accept your gracious hospitality. <laughs> Uh, 
Tis but a poor apartment, Your Highness. Yet, of its humble means, pray avail yourself to the fullest. Your quarters may be humble, Miles Hendon. Yet, you impress me of being of noble birth in mien and carriage. Little wonder, Your Highness, my father was titled, till he incurred the displeasures of the king by sitting in his presence. Then, for your deed this day, I shall have your title restored. Thank you, Your Highness. Oh, I find myself fatigued, Hendon. I shall avail myself of the bed. Uh, you may sleep on the floor by the door and guard my presence. Sleep on the... Uh, yes, yes, as you wish, Your Highness. Uh, prithee, call me when you have obtained food and the table is spread. Of course, Your Highness. Hmm. Poor unfortunate lad. His mind must be touched through ill usage. Why should I not be his friend and aid him in his malady? I, as an elder brother, I shall watch over him and guard him. <laughs> Even though it be on this barren floor rather than on my own bed, I wonder what transpires in that poor, disordered mind. Why does the prince not return? Why does he tarry so long? If someone should enter here whilst I am arrayed in his clothes, it would, it would be worth my head to... Good day to you, dear cousin. Cousin? Oh, why stayest thou in my chamber whilst... Oh, but, but what ails thee, my lord? Art thou ill? Art thou... Oh, please, please, my lady, be merciful. I am not thy lord, but only poor Tom Canty of awful court. Find the prince, I pray thee, that my rags may be returned, and I may leave. I beg of thee, my lady. On my bended knee, I beg of thee. Oh, my lord. On thy knees? To me? What, what sort of joke is this? Oh, it is no joke, my lady. I swear it. They will hang me for this. Are you mad, cousin? Have you lost your mind that you should... Oh, lost you. Oh, my lord. Oh, your highness. Oh, my lord. I tell you, sir, it is true. I was just with him. The prince has lost his mind. Aye, aye, there is no doubt, my lord, the prince is mad. His own physician swears to it. Every physician in London, with the exception of the king's own, knows of it, my lord chancellor. The prince is hopelessly insane. Your majesty, I, I know not how to broach this to you. But His Royal Highness Edward Tudor, the Prince of Wales, is... Thou is... liest, Chancellor! Edward is not insane! The mind of my son and heir, Edward Tudor, is uh, uh, befuddled. Yet he is my son and heir, and shall rule England when I'm gone. Issue this proclamation in my name. The affliction of the Prince is not to be spoken of, nor given any attention, under penalty of death. His hallucinations and his whims are not to be noticed. This is my command. Why dost thou not prepare to sup, cousin? Thou seemest so preoccupied. Sup? Oh, how can I have appetite, my lady? If only someone would believe me ere it is too late, before some tragedy occurs, the... What is that, Lady Jane? Are we to have music? Not so, Your Highness. It was sounded for the presence of the Lord Chancellor. Your Majesty. Majesty! Your Majesty. May I have permission to make an announcement of gravest import? Why, why, yes, pray do. Noble lords and ladies, I bring you the gravest of tidings. The King is dead. The king is dead. Long live the king! Long live the king! Long live the king? Oh, but, but Edward is not here. He... I... Then... Then I... I am... am the king. Yes, your majesty. You are the king. Ruler of all England. Oh, but I, I cannot be. A pauper cannot be king. 
king? What shall I do? What does a king say? What... But wait, Tom Candy. You have often dreamed of what it would be like to be king. Of what royal commands thou wouldst give. How you would relieve suffering, pain, injustice. And until Edward returns, you could do these things. You, Tom Candy, the pauper. Your Majesty. Oh, but no matter what they call me, I am still a beggar. A lad of the streets. No one would obey me. Oh, but if they would, if they only would. Your Majesty. What? Oh, I am a lady. You must say something, Your Majesty. You must speak. Speak? I... I must... Yes. Noble lords and ladies, at this moment of great tragedy and high honor, I, your king, have but this to say. From this day hence, the king's law shall be that of righteousness and not of injustice. From this day hence, the king's law shall be the law of mercy and never more be the law of blood. This, this is tragic news you bring me, Miles Hendon. The king, my father, is dead. I, your high... Your Majesty, thou canst not sorrow. The king is dead. Long live the king. Aye. Thou art right, Miles. I am the king, even though an imposter sits upon my throne. An imposter, Your Majesty, but one with the instincts and heart of a true king of England. What meanest thou, Miles? His proclamations are being mouthed all over London, sire. The king's law is to be one of righteousness and not injustice. One of mercy and not of blood. Injustice? Blood? Surely these were not the laws of the land under my father. Were they not, Your Majesty? I refuse to believe this, Miles. Thou must prove these words, lest I again remove your titles when I have returned to the palace and assumed my rightful throne. Very well, Your Majesty, I shall prove them to you. In the slums of London, in its prisons... I, Your Majesty, I shall prove it to you, so that if some day you do become king, your intentions shall be as good as those of him who now sits upon your throne. Those hovels, those hutches not fit for swine to live in, those are the habitations of London's poor? I, Your Majesty, with not one law of the land to protect them, to offer hope, to let them believe in the goodness of humanity. No, no, I cannot believe. That woman to be burned alive, and solely because she worships God in a different form. These things cannot be, Miles. I shall change them. I must change them. As King of England, I cannot allow these crimes against humanity to continue. King, thou might be, Your Majesty, but thou art forgetting that another sits upon thy throne. I, I, I had forgot. A pauper has taken my place. How can a beggar rule with the wisdom of royal blood? How can a pauper have the heart and soul and kindness of a prince? Mercy is not the prerogative of royalty alone, nor kindness only within the hearts of princes. You yourself are proof that appearance oft deceives. I pray you, Your Majesty... Do not judge the pauper till his guilt or innocence be proved by his deeds. If it would please your grace, here is a paper of state to be signed. A paper, my lord chancellor? Concerning what? Taxes, your majesty, to be levied upon the people of London. And for what purpose? Gifts for the nobles, Your Majesty. 
Our treasury is low. We have not paid gifts to the nobility. Take this paper away. I beg your majesty's pardon. Take it away, I say. No longer shall we tax the poor and helpless for useless gifts to nobles. The people are oppressed enough. Let us seek to lighten their burdens rather than make them heavier. Why is your majesty so unhappy? Never has a king been more loved and respected. And they say more people are coming to your coronation than have ever come before. My coronation, my lady? Oh, it is not mine. They come to pay homage to an imposter. If only I could find him. If only I could find the true king. Oh, you still cling to your hallucination, sire. So sincerely that... that sometimes I believe you. But how can I? There is a nobility in your face that cannot be denied. There is no nobility in my heart, Lady Jane. Only guilt regarding him who was tricked by fate. If a trick of fate it be, Your Majesty, then your coronation tomorrow shall surely guarantee its continuance. If so, my lady, I can only pray that I shall be worthy of it. Archbishop of Canterbury awaits your majesty. Very well, Lord Chancellor. Let us proceed. Edward Tudor, in the name of our Lord, and with his holy blessings, I do hereby crown you Edward the Sixth. King of... I forbid you to set the crown of England upon that forfeited head. I am the king. God! God, seize that man! Seize him, I say! Hey, touch him not! On your peril, touch him not! He is the king! Your majesty, you are afflicted again. Your madness... Nay, he speaks the truth. I am an imposter, but not of my own choosing. I told all of you, but none would believe me. You thought me mad. Well, there stands your true king in beggar's rags. Look upon him. Look upon his face. There stands Edward Tudor, true King of England. The resemblance, it is unbelievable. But how can one say? How can there be proof? Oh, surely, Your Majesty, thou must be able to offer some proof of some kind. Think, Your Majesty, I, I beg of you, think. I, Tom Canty, I can give them proof. You, my Lord Chancellor, the Great Seal of England is hidden in a special vault within my bedchamber. Aye, that is so. You, Lord William, uh, took me for a carriage ride when I was but a child, uh, against my father's wishes, secretly, so only you and I know of this. That is true, that is true. And you, Lady Jane, when abroad, I sent you three gifts, a shawl from Spain, perfume from France, and a Latin book from Rome. Oh, yes, yes, you did. My Lord Chancellor, he did. There is your proof, then. Now you know. My Lord Chancellor, there stands your true king. Aye! Aye, Aye he is the king. God, seize this imposter. To the tower with him. To the tower! Hold! Touch him and you risk your life. Why should he be punished? Because you did not believe him? Because he ruled you wisely and well? No. He shall hold a place of honor here while I take the crown. Come, Tom Canty, my arm. My Lord Chancellor, you may proceed with the ceremony. By all means, Your Majesty. Page to the palace and fetch new robes for the king. Nay, my Lord Chancellor, I do not wish to change. But, Your Majesty, taking the crown in beggar's rags, what will your people think? What dost thou know of my people, or what they think? I have been one of them. 
I have shared their pain and misery and suffering. I have won the right to wear these rags, and proudly. Your pardon, Majesty. I merely meant that it is not fitting for thee to wear the robes of one of such lowly birth. Is it not, my Lord Chancellor? I disagree. Tom Canty, the pauper, has been both noble and wise. These were his robes, the robes of a nobleman born in a slum. Robes that any prince, any king, would be honored to wear. For it is not what a man becomes that matters. It is what he becomes and not where he was born. And the robe of true greatness is humility. Carlton Young again. What an echo Mark Twain sent ringing down the years with the words, Mercy is not the prerogative of royalty alone, nor kindness only in the hearts of princes. Our very thinking about these words truly becomes a prayer. For what was true of the prince and true of the pauper is true of all of us. It is what a man becomes that matters, not where he was born. And while we speak of prayer... We want to mention a particular kind of prayer, family prayer. When with prayer on our lips and in our hearts, we can look at each other and contemplate the blessings of God that we, all of us, receive from happy family life. The blessings that come when a family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood Family Theater has brought you Roddy McDowell and Terry Kilburn in Mark Twain's classic, The Prince and the Pauper, with Carlton Young as your host. This adaptation was performed with permission of the trustees of Mark Twain's estate. And featured in our cast were Francis X. Bushman, Virginia McDowell, Edgar Barrier, Raymond Burr, Alec Harford, and Herbert Rollinson. Music was composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman, and the production was directed for Family Theater by Jaime Del Valle. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who felt the need for this type of program, by the mutual network which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who have so unselfishly given of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Gene Baker expressing the wishes of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to join us next week at this time when family theater will present Rosalind Russell, Joseph Cotton, and Gene Cagney in Germelshausen. Join us, won't you? Family Theater is broadcast in the Philippines by the Philippine Broadcasting Corporation, is released to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service, and is heard in Canada over the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. This is the world's largest network, the Mutual Broadcasting System. That is all for this episode of Not Just Yesterday. Thank you for listening. As usual, this is Zoe Dean signing off, reminding you as always, dear friends, to take care of yourselves and keep smiling. You seem to bring far away spring near me. I'm always in full bloom when you're in the room for every night at seven. You're right, you're right.
Every time the same thing happens I fall once again in love But only with you Every night about seven 